Welcome to Thoughtful Planning, the place where real conversation, expert insight, and a touch of humor meet to turn our end-of-life uncertainties into self-assurance. I'm your co-host, Santiago, a history buff and a big kid at heart. And I'm Honey, your guide through the intricate dance of planning with care and a whole lot of warmth. Every week, we're here to turn those intimidating are we ready moments into confident everything is under control moments. Today's journey is one you won't want to miss. Hi, welcome back to Thoughtful Planning. My name is Santiago, your host, and this is my mother. Hi, I'm Virginia Bueno. And today we're going to share a story about the passing of my father, her husband of how many years, Mom? We were married 42 years, 42 and a half years. 42 and a half years. So a couple of days. So before we start, I'd like to start you off with an essential question. So I want you to think about this. Do your loved ones, uh, your spouse, your husband, your children, know what to do with the paperwork that you have ready? Do they actually know what steps to take? So I remember the day that dad died. It was actually a nice day. I was at at Fort Lewis, Washington, training with the cadets. And we were actually doing uh, EO training. So there was this huge tent, and they had some method actors out there acting out different scenarios. Steve called. My brother, Stephen, called. He usually doesn't call me. So I took the phone call, walked out, and he told me that something had happened to dad yeah. at the work site. I don't know, were you with him at that point when he called me, or...? No, I made phone calls. I received a message from your dad's phone, and it was a stranger. Hmm. And he said, I work with Jimmy. And he told me that they were at the hospital. So I reached out to all of you. So I was, uh, again, I was in the Army at the time, uh, and I was at field training with, with our cadets at their summer training. And... The thing I remember is going down to my knees and my uh, sergeant major walking out to me and kneeling down. And he heard the conversation. He and another NCO came to my side and they picked me up. They said, don't let the cadet see you like this. So I knew that uh, I had to come home. And what I ended up doing was we went to the headquarters, told them what was going on. We waited for the paperwork to get there. Red Cross had to be notified. And then the Army put me on the next thing, smoking home the next morning. It was like 7.30 in the morning, something like that. I got back, and I just remember telling Steve when he picked me up the airport, damn, it's hot. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it, was, it was hot. Yes. It was a summer day. It was, if I'm not mistaken, the, 20, the 20, 20 seconds. 22nd of July. So we went to the hospital to see what was going on. And then I know Mom and I had a conversation about paperwork. Yep, documentation. So I asked, you know, where's the paperwork? What do you got? And uh, you said something happened to you that night, too, did it not? I had a, a dream, of course, Jim, my husband telling me documentation, documentation. And uh, that was the Friday night when I went home. And I saw Santiago the next day. And I said, uh, your dad told me documentation that's the only word that came out of his mouth and uh what my son had said was we need to get all his documentation together so it was i've always had these type of senses of of dreams so it was something that had to be done so dad had prepared he had his all his papers in files but the issue that we ran into was the order that they were in. And he had some papers here, there. In his own way, he was organized. He had them in manila folders. And he always told me, you're going to need this. You're going to need that. Don't forget to use this. Don't forget to do that. But I didn't know who to call. I did not know where to start. And that's where my son stepped up. And he did an amazing job of organizing everything. Bought a binder, bought slips, binder covers, and we just kept filing everything, got his will, and uh, Santiago made phone calls. He knew what to do. 
Well, to be fair, I was, uh, I'd been a casualty assistance officer. So we had a, a soldier die on duty when I was assigned to the Pentagon. And uh, I still had my files from that. So I knew exactly who to contact on posts and stuff like that. So for me, it was a learning process when we did it with my XO. And then it was kind of still fresh in my mind when I had to do it for my father. But we had some hard decisions even before we got through the paperwork because at the job site where my dad worked, uh, they didn't have CPR training, correct? They had CPR training. It was a Friday. On Fridays, being an iron worker, it was payday. They closed the first aid area, which was gated and locked. They closed it 30 minutes beforehand, which didn't help any. So the two that supposedly were in charge of doing CPR that day left early. They wanted to go and be with their families. And as far as Jim was concerned, it was okay. He was the foreman. He said it was okay. But the guys that were left behind, when they saw Jim collapse, they didn't know what to do. They did not know CPR. They were not trained. And that was 11 minutes of no oxygen before EMS arrived. So uh, that was a big factor in his death. When I got to the hospital, my father was already brain dead. They had him hooked up to all types of machines. And we waited a couple of days and we had a pretty frank conversation with the immediate family, my two brothers, Stephen and Bill, and then my sister, Sarah, and my, of course, my mom on what we wanted to do for dad. He didn't have a do not resuscitate order, doctor's direct. No, he? he had my word. Okay. He told me he did not want to be hooked up to anything. He did not want to be an invalid. I had already prepared. I owned my own daycare, reached out to the daycare parents, and I told them I might be closing my daycare. If my husband survives this, he's going to need help. And they were all prepared. But he had told me, don't, don't leave me like this. Don't leave me hooked up to everything. So I didn't. The doctors kept telling me his organs were shutting down and that we had to make the decision. Yeah, so uh, they came in. I remember they did a little test on his shin bone and on his feet and stuff. At that point, we knew that, that he was no longer with us there in his, his body. He was probably around, floating around somewhere, telling us what to do. Yes. We just couldn't hear him. Yes. So we went into a room and we talked about it. And we all decided that we needed to take him off sooner rather than later because that was his wishes. And mom had asked me at the time, do you want to wait for your kids to get there? And uh, I said, no, I did not want my children to see my father like that. The last time they had actually seen him was at Christmas, and it was a joyful yeah. time. And that's really how I wanted them to remember him. And to be honest and fair, my kids were upset with me that I did not let them see him one last time to talk to him. But we explained that he was no longer there, that I didn't want him to have their last memory to be like that. So, and you know what day we made that decision? On uh the 25th. 25th of July. Yeah, on Dia de los Santiago, St. James Day. So when you listen to my story, you can understand it's kind of weird that 25th of July is a recurring date in our family. So we'll explain that, or we have explained that in episode one. So take a look at that if you haven't seen that. So uh, we made that decision the next day. We brought in his brothers and sisters that were still with us. They brought him into a room and they ended up, you know, taking him off of life support at that time. And do uh, you remember anything about that day? Well, what I remember about that day is he kind of gave a smile. He frowned like he was sorry when his, he took his last breath. But he smiled and it hit everyone, everyone in the room. 
his six sisters and his three brothers were there with their designated others. And uh, it was something that I'll never forget. Yeah, I thought that was because he made that little face. And then it was just like, he, and he had a smile. Yeah, and it yes. was like, he was relieved that we made the decision. And we were all there. We were all there. That was the an experience. Like I said, no one, I wish no one would have to go through that. But there are times that you have to make split decisions. There are people that have their families that are dying of cancer or other illnesses, and they have time to prepare. But sudden, like this, from a Friday to the next Tuesday or Wednesday, I can't remember which day it was, that's short, very short time to get everything together, to get documentation together. So, And we were lucky also that nobody objected. All of us were standing strong behind my mom. You know, she knew him better than anybody else. Yeah. We were together since high school. So we were together for about three and a half years before we got married. So we were best buds. I mean, yeah, since you were, what, 15? Yeah, well, I met him when I was 12. So we were neighbors. We lived around the block from each other. So one day he said, do you want to ride home? And got into his 57 Chevy. My best friend between us didn't trust him. (laughs) I didn't know what to expect. But from there on, you know, uh, we were friends. I was friends with his family. I know it was hard on you that day going home, not sure what to do. Luckily, I'd already started talking to Fort Sam. Well, the first thing I did after I left there, I left alone. And I parked behind the uh, funeral home and I called my mom and told her and she relayed the message to the rest of my family. And we took care of what we had to take care of. Oh, that's all we could do is get together and see what we could do. And so um, luckily I had my checklist and I started calling folks, making copies of papers. Uh, one of the things that when we talked to the funeral home was we made sure that we had extra copies of the death certificate. I, I think you probably have a couple of those left. I over still somewhere. have those. And I can't recall the name of the other one that gave me power to do. You already had the power of attorney and stuff no, like that. There was uh, another. I should have brought my the binder. Hmm. Yeah. I can't remember. There is documentation. You you have to take these steps. If If you don't take these steps... Whoever you go to to try to make arrangements is just going to back away and say, you don't have all your paperwork together. We can't help you right now. As soon as you get this paperwork, then we can help you. But we had to to turn off his his, his VA benefits. We had to do all that stuff. Going to Fort Sam, I was still, like I said, on active duty. I was a lieutenant colonel at the time, walking in addressing and speaking for my mom and walking through her being there and just having the right paperwork. When we walked through, we made extra copies of his DD-214, which is documentation of service, uh, documentation that he had actually retired from the military. He was in the room. He was active duty, then he went to the reserve. So we had all that stuff. Luckily, we got in pretty quickly Yes, to Fort Sam to the National Cemetery. Usually there's, especially now, a little bit of a wait to get in, but we were able to get in rather quickly. I had some accumulated leave in the military and a very supportive boss at the time, my brigade commander, told me, hey, take some time, get your mom squared away, get your dad, you know, squared away. And it's little things that, especially for those that have a military member that that passes away, making sure the ribbons, my father wanted to be buried in his uniform. So making sure we had all brand new ribbons, the order that they went in, everything was squared away, measured out correct, because he would have probably gotten up and and beat me upside the head if I didn't have him looking right. And there were some things he wanted to be buried with, his Mustang jacket. And how long did he coach with the Mustangs? He coached youth sports for 26 years. Started. 
putting Santiago in in uh, 1978, and by 1979 he was coaching. And uh, we uh, had his uh, jacket. He had to have a Packers, something Packers, Green Bay Packers, in uh, the casket with him as well. And Jim and I had a $5 bet. Whoever goes first wins. <laughs> And uh, I wrote on a $5 bill until we meet again, and I put it in his pocket before we closed the casket. I think uh, everyone had a little trinket. My kids had something that they wanted to put in. But the Mustangs was the biggest thing for him to coach Pop Warner football. When we went to the, uh, once we got everything taken care of, it really wasn't that hard to do. It was just time consuming, making sure we had the right papers to the right office. And for me, I think it was, they just wanted to get me out of there because I was pretty vocal. And they were like, let's get this dude out of there. And I don't uh, know where he gets his pushing us from. I think the chunkla had something to do with it. <laughs> wooden spoons, maybe. I don't know. But what we did, we were able to get my father buried with honors at the Fort Sam National Cemetery. Within a week. Within a week, yeah. And I just remember the when we went into the church, all the people that came, it was humbling uh, to know how many people came up and said, you know, he was my coach. You know, I remember, you know, this, that about your dad. He was a mean old, you know what, a lot of that. And in fact, later in life, the man that my sister married turned out that he was coached by my dad, didn't even know it. He met my husband after my husband died. That's, he said, he always told my daughter, there's this guy, this old man. He never gave up on me. They misspelled my name on the chart. And it read more or less. And his name was Morales. And he would tell this kid, sometimes you give me more. Sometimes you give me less. And it instilled in this eight-year-old. And he never forgot that old man. Then he saw my husband's picture up this play in my home. And he said, that's the old man that coached me. What Albert didn't know was that my husband was his uncle's first sergeant. My daughter went on 2012, in 2011, right after Jim died, she met Albert and they went to a Christmas party out of town where his uncles lived. And she introduced herself as Sarah Bueno. And the Morales is said, two of them looked at each other and said, we need one. He was our first sergeant. And they told her stories and brought her to tears. They cried. He had an impact on a lot of people, and a lot of people haven't forgotten him. But the main thing is, even with all these memories, being able to get all this documentation together was my main priority. And like I said, that's the main concern that I have for a lot of people. Even if there's people that are ill with a long illness, are they prepared? We don't know. Yeah, and as we say and or said in episode one, when we and I were going through what I was going through, we were not prepared. We're still not prepared. And we told you this, where this is a journey. And this is a story to help hopefully inspire you to get your stuff together, get your paperwork squared away. Just because you know where everything is, you know what to do with it. The question is, do your loved ones know what to do with it? It's a hard discussion to have, not fun, but it, it is necessary. So in our episode about hospice, we're going to talk a little bit about the necessary paperwork you need to have if you have a long-term illness. And that's something that my mother was just talking about, making sure we had that prepared. And it's kind of hard to do. It's a hard discussion. Anyway. Um, uh, sometimes your spouse wants to say, well, I don't want to talk about it. I don't, I don't want to know what's going to happen. But that is the biggest mistake people can make nowadays, not to know what's going to happen. 
I even have my grandson prepared. I said, now I want you to know where this is so you can have it ready. If you're the one that's here and someone says, do you know where grandma's paperwork is? Do you know where mom's paperwork is? Well, they know where it is and they have to go from there. And it's in the same binder that my son prepared for my husband, but the binder is in a safe. <laughs> so In the whole closet there? Somewhere? In yeah. the closet. Yeah. All right. Not that I know how to get into it, but yeah, just being prepared. And I know mom still goes out there every anniversary, his yes. anniversary, which I just passed, birthday, and then on the day that he passed, putting out Green Bay Packers stuff that somebody takes off. We're in Dallas no, country. No, they didn't take that. I put spurs. I didn't know what to do, oh. even when it came to decorations, because... He wasn't a flower person. So I would put Spurs koozie, a Green Bay koozie, and uh, a Pepsi bottle. He was a Pepsi holic. And I went one day to collect everything because they give you a certain day that they clear everything out that if you want to keep something. And all the Spurs stuff was missing. And I went and complained. And I said, they didn't take any of the Green Bay Packers things. <laughs> and they said, we're not Packers fans. Nobody wants that. So I'll never forget that. And I'm pretty sure my husband was, you know, rolling and laughing. That, nope, you can yeah. leave all that here. Yeah, they, it probably meant more to him than the Spurs got. Oh, so, yes. To tell you the truth. But again, like I, Honey and I had said in our first episode, you know, this is a journey. We want to let you know where we've been or we're not lawyers. We want to inform you of what's happened in our life. And this was a, it should have been an eye awakening moment for me, but it wasn't. I went home and I was like, told honey, we got to get our stuff together. And I was numb. When Jim died, I was numb. You just can't think straight. You have to be prepared. That's the bottom line. And that's what this whole thing that we're, the reason we're doing this is because I don't want honey to be worried. I'm hoping that. My children, I know my children will be strong enough to help my wife. My wife's a very strong-willed person. She's She'll be able to keep it straight for a bit, but I don't want her to worry. So if you take anything away from this, I want you to go back and reflect on that essential question that we talked at the beginning of this podcast. Do your loved ones know what to do with your paperwork? Even though you have it, do they know how to make sure that your final wishes are taken care of. Do they know exactly what to do, especially with the military? This will give your family peace of mind to yeah. have this taken care of. Yeah, sure. Well, so if you like more information and you would like to subscribe to our Facebook page, please do so. Look for the link in the show notes below. And we're going to share a lot of checklists with you, points of contact, Now, most of the stuff that we will share is relevant, especially to Texas and in the military. But take a look. No matter where you live, I bet you there's a rule that fits. And uh, the paperwork's the paperwork. You have to have all that documentation squared away. You have anything else to add, Ma? No. I think we did a good job here. I I think. I hope this helps everyone out. It will. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. And until next time, we hope that everything that you planned for is executed exactly like you want it to be. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And just like the vibrant hues of a setting sun, we're wrapping up another episode of Thoughtful Planning. Every shared story and insight is a step closer to turning uncertainty into celebrations of preparedness. Absolutely. And to our listeners, remember that every surprise that comes our way is an opportunity to grow, adapt, and learn. Stay tuned for more stories, expert insight, and of course, a touch of wit in our next episode. We're not just co-hosts, we're fellow travelers on this journey. For more information on additional resources, which will help you take the next step in planning, look for the link in the show notes for our membership. Join us next time for another episode of Thoughtful Planning. Until then, keep living, laughing, and loving every moment.